Hello and welcome to round one coverage here at Grand Prix Richmond, the format's legacy. I'm Brian David Marshall. I'm joined in the booth by Eduardo Sajgalik, and we are watching, well, legacy stalwart Drew Levin and uh, another legacy stalwart here, <laughs> Nick Miller. Uh, two guys uh, who are facing off here in round one. And as you can see, it looks like the matchup is burn versus in fact. What do you like here in this matchup, Eduardo? All right, this is always uh, a fun one. Um, trying to figure out a matchup you've never seen in <laughs> Legacy. Here's uh, Goblin Guide, turn one from Drew Levin. Right. Just a misty rainforest on the other side of the table from Nick Miller. You see he offers yeah. it up. Right. Respecting uh, days. Well, yeah, th it's a possibility, and uh, Nick might be posturing here, but Days is a card, and in fact, it's just that setting you back a turn this early. Nick would have to plan several turns ahead and just try to think, okay, what is this Goblin Guide actually trying to do? Also, you see a Force of Will in hand for Nick Miller, so, you know, yep. obviously another free spell that you got to be uh, concerned about. And uh, right. <laughs> he's like, I will attack you. And uh, we get that info. But I think it, here the thing is, you might actually be coming from Modern. So I want to make sure to make it clear, this is Legacy, not Modern. Um, which And there's going to be a few key differences in both these decks. Um, those free spells you mentioned, uh, Days and Force of Will are going to be in the Infect deck. And rather than uh, what you see in Modern with cards like Might of Ulcroza or Groundswell, um, the Modern Infect deck gets to play with Invigorate. And Invigorate, mm. in fact, is incredible. It's, it's a free plus four plus four since giving your opponent free life is not exactly a drawback when you're trying to poison them out. And that plus another copy of it and uh, an extra attack from uh, a Noble Hierarch pump or um, essentially a an attack from earlier, or you can combine it with Berserk, one of the early oh, cards. Oh, yes. Yes, and that's that's 10 points right there. And for very little, you know, free and one mana. The burn deck, however, also gets upgrades. You, you see some of the spells that the modern deck plays, but one of the d spells that they have access to, there, there's two important different spells here. Um, main deck is Fire Blast. Uh, sacrificing two mana to deal four damage at any time means that the burn deck can really... Start piling in that damage early on with Goblin Guide, Eidolon of the Great Reval, um, or Monastery Swift Sphere, and then get through. And then finally, Fire Blast. You also get access to Price of Progress. Now, Price of Progress is an incredible burn spell. Dealing two damage per non-basic means that you have access to something that can not just deal sometimes four, but upwards six, eight, ten damage in a single spell. Um, and if, you, if we get to see more burn on camera, you get to see some really sweet plays. For example, having to wasteland your own land to prevent four life <laughs> being lost. <laughs> so you see Blighted Agent was the play from Nick Miller. An unblockable infect creature. Although burn feels like, uh, burn feels like it's got to be a tough matchup for the infect deck. Um, yeah, this is kind of... It, it, it depends kind of entirely on the burn spells that you draw. Something like Lava Spike isn't exactly going to help you against the Infect deck. Uh, and yeah, here you see Drew uh, like deciding, I'm going to Lightning Bolt now. And this is very common when you're playing against Infect to not, because their whole strategy revolves around boosting their creature. So firing your uh, burn spell now is good. Um, the thing, though, is that you see that ink, that land, that Ink Moth Nexus, looks really innocent, but is anything but. Essentially, oh, yeah. right, because Nick can activate that Ink Moth uh, um, at, at his leisure. It means that, well, when Nick decides to go in for the kill, you activate Ink Moth Nexus. If you have access to two Invigorates, th there's nothing the Burn player can do, and it's a lot harder for the Burn player to interact when they miss their second land drop. Like, uh, and, the, and the, yeah, the fact that Drew, Drew being stuck on one land is, I mean, you keep a lot of one-landers with burn, but usually those are not winning games if they, they uh, go past one or two turns where you miss a land end. Uh, Nick, it gives Nick all the time in the world to try to set up the combo, and it's going to be really easy to stop um, Drew from interacting simply because the access to f days when your opponent has one land, like days right. is incredible in this spot. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, here, um, I mean, Nick could win this turn if, if he had access to Invigorate and Berserk. Um, if he doesn't, though, most likely what we're going to see is activate Nick Moth Nexus to get in for one damage. Um, or, uh, yeah, try to set up for later. Um, since Nick decided to fetch right away, though, I assume we're going to see uh, him tap out for some frets. Yeah, he's just got another Blighted Agent. Yeah. 
But yeah, it, it makes sense here to cast the Blighted Agent if you do have access to it. But actually, if Nick had a Force of Will, um, it might have been worth getting that point of infect in. Um, and the reason for that is that two invigorates with a previous point of infect would be lethal. So it's a lot harder to predict a Blighted Agent because Drew can interact at the sorcery speed dur during his, uh, their turn. So that means that, you know, ultimately Drew is going to be able to target that Blighted Agent. Eight Moth Nexus, you have to wait until it's Nick's turn. And that's a lot harder to interact with. If, if your opponent goes invigorate in response to your burn spell, you're not getting anywhere. So if they have access to it too, you're, 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 you're in a position where you just can't stop them. Um, yeah, and here, yeah, I might have given the point of infect in, but it really depends on the texture of Nick's hand. At this point, there, there's just not enough information for, for me to make the call on what the better play may have been here. But it is an option to keep in mind sometimes, especially because your win condition is so cheap, as in it doesn't cost mana, really. <laughs> Getting that point of, po of poison in is great. Drew's trying to decide here what he wants to do. He had an option between lightning bolting that Blighted Agent and playing a second Goblin Guide and advancing his clock. Yeah, yeah, and I think Drew correctly is advancing uh, his clock here. And, and the reason for that is he, he realizes that he could, um, you know, destroy the, the, the Blighted Agent, but, but in truth, well, there's still that Ink Moth Nexus, and the, the, the way to get in and win is free. So at that point, you realize, well... This Blighted Agent isn't really changing things too dramatically. So I might as well get a Goblin Guide down and try to win. If, if Drew has access to Fire Blast in hand... He has one in hand. And oh, he perfect. has a Lightning Bolt in hand as well. Right. So th this might be uh, a kill. Th this might be just good enough for next turn. Um, so there's a land off the oh, top. Oh, wow. Two lands <laughs> off the top for Nick. <laughs> wow. Right. Well, yeah, the little drawback. I like how Goblin Guide is either the best card ever where you get to see your opponent's entire hand or the worst card ever where you <laughs> it literally <laughs> makes them draw infinite cards. It's a reverse Howling Mine. But still no second land for Drew. He's yeah. got uh, he's got all the blowtorches in the world, but he has no, no flint to start <laughs> it with here. He's got nothing to, to fire off his hand. Yeah. And uh, here we see a brainstorm. Yeah. <laughs> well, we did say earlier that certain cards might have been banned from the early days of Magic, like Ancestral Recall. Brainstorm does a pretty good impression. You do at least start the same way, you know, drawing free <laughs> cards. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, you're, if, if you have not seen Legacy before, and if you haven't, welcome. This is a sweet format. Um, brainstorm is a ubiquitous card. It's everywhere. And the reason for that is that, I, I mean, the delta on that card is very high. If you brainstorm lock yourself, which is to say you cast the card, put two cards on top, and can't get rid of them by a shuffle or do any relevant actions, it's very bad. But or draw them by being attacked by two goblin guides. Th yeah, that is a very sweet interaction. <laughs> you can put lands on top and those goblin guides attack, you draw the cards again. Um, but at its best, you're drawing free cards, putting two cards you do not want, and shuffling them away. And it can really act as close to Ancestral Recall as you can dream. And yeah, and here you see, yeah, Wooded Foothills, and Nick is going to shuffle away the two cards he put back on top. Yeah. I, the question I, is, can he win here? I, we, haven't, we haven't gotten a real look at what his hand is. He's, you know, maybe a little more used to how these matches work on camera <laughs> and is playing his cards a little closer to the chest. Right. Now, the thing, though, is that, that will have – a brainstorm will completely change the texture of your hand. Drawing free cards is enormous. And yeah, here we, well, we're going to get a really quick answer as to whether uh, Nick has access to lethal, but it doesn't seem so. It just seems like one poison. It, it's worth noting how close Drew is to actually winning. Those Goblin Guides have dealt a lot of damage, especially the first one. And the thing is, if Drew draws a land, he can fire off a flurry of burn spells plus that fire blast. Um, but he has to be aware that if Nick is not winning the game here, it means that Nick probably has access to a ton of counter magic so it's going to be really hard for for drew to to land those spells in and um deal lethal damage right, however there, these goblin guides are good there for that there's, there's a second copy of blighted agent yeah um so see just that one effect in fact on on drew's uh life total but as you said with two copies of invigorate that that could be enough right exactly that first point turn. of infect damage is very important um the other important tool because we're talking about plus four plus four from invigorate um, essentially, if your opponent is at five infect or going to five, that's also an important number. So one invigorate um, 
with one creature at, with an opponent at five infect is enough. And here we have Ink Moth Nexus, Blighted Agent, Blighted Agent. Um, so we're, we're kind of one short unless Nick uh, gets a copy of Pendlehaven. But even then, you're still uh, one off, I believe. Let's see, that would be four. Plus one, plus two would be five. So yeah, an Invigorate wouldn't quite do it. And the fact that Nick couldn't find um, a way, essentially, here to push through that additional damage kind of leads me to believe that, yeah, his hand seems just chock a full of counter magic, but it, his board is not that well, well equipped to deal with these Goblin Guides. All right, well, here come two Goblin Guides. Wow. wow. <laughs> and wow. post-shuffle, he still gets two lands. <laughs> wow, that is... That is th those uh, Goblin Guides have uh, explored a lot of new territory right here. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Drew did draw a Nared Misa, which is <laughs> very critical. Um, allowing, and now Drew is going to have to play this quite casually. He, he, Drew understands that Nick has access to probably a lot of counter magic. Otherwise, Nick would have just tried to win. And, and this block might seem, by the way, weird. But it makes sense since Nick already has more than enough pressure on board. Uh, he d simply needs some pump spells. So, like, stopping the Goblin Guide here prevents two damage and might prevent an additional point of damage from a future attack. Right. So he falls to seven here. So, on paper, dead to Lightning Bolt, Fire Blast, but right. that ends terribly for uh, Drew Levin. Right. I mean, I, I think you're going to pro uh, Drew is likely to fire off a Burn Spell, but Fire Blast is really the last. That, that's uh, the absolutely. Burn Spell you fire at the very end. Because once those lands are gone, they're gone. You're not top decking burn spells <laughs> with zero lands in play. Or you might, but it's not going to help you much. Um, so Drew is going to have to play this a little casually, try to fire off at uh, Nick's end of turn. It, it, it is worth noting um, that in Legacy, playing spells end of turn has sometimes less use, um, simply because the counter magic is free. So there's not as much need as you would in, say, Standard or Modern to tax someone's counter magic. Um, in Legacy, that means that you're trying to time... Uh, a lot of a lethal spell or a spell you really want to resolve. Sometimes at really weird moments. For example, uh, timing it in the middle of br uh, before brainstorm resolves can be common because what matters is the number of cards your opponent has in hand. Not so much that they're tapped out because they could daze or force of will. And the counter magic is very cheap. It's spell pierces one blue, fluster storms one blue mana. So that means that that's why you're you're gonna maybe see. Uh, I think towards the tail end of today and tomorrow, people responding to draw spells with the key spells they want to resolve um, rather than when their opponents tap out because that's what matters, is those access to those cards in hand, not as much the mana that um, they have access to in play. So Although Nick goes to yeah. six here, by the way, from his fetch land, uh, Vernon Catacombs, uh, which now puts him within double bolt range. Right, and it was interesting that Drew decided not to fire off that Lava Spike. Um, that, that he had access to. So I'm, I, I believe Drew is going to try to play Price of Progress at the end of turn. Um, simply to... Uh, I, mean, I mean, he's pretty aware uh, that it won't there, work. There's an Invigorate. Uh, that, that's something Nick just drew that, by the way. So just drew an Invigorate. I don't know if he has any others. I just... Uh, so you can see if you control a forest, you can have them gain three life instead of paying the mana cost. You just don't care about their life total at all. Right. Th th this this reads about zero mana plus four plus four. Uh, the control of forest part can actually be relevant sometimes against uh, opponents that are wasteland uh, with wasteland and life from the loam. So that can happen. But otherwise the spell is just by far the best card in the infect deck. It may, it's what makes the deck tick. The fact that invigorate causes zero mana. Well there's Vines of the Vastwood. Right. And yeah, and I was talking earlier about the fact that Invigorate, um, double Invigorate is the way to go, but obviously you can't play more than four copies of that card and you need access to more than four. So Vines of Vastwood kind of comes in. It's both a protection spell. I was just saying, right, it's also, it also serves as a green counter spell in this deck. Yeah, it, it definitely can, uh, especially when you're trying to grind your opponent with Infect, which can happen. It, it, you're not necessarily in that combo finish, right? Sometimes you have Noble Hierarch and... Ink Moth Nexus, and you're getting two poison in a turn, and then you just need, you know, that, that one uh, pump spell, and that's enough. And then, like, the vines can be a cheap way to, to counter. Yeah, but Drew is forced to react here. This is uh, lethal damage is being presented, so Drew's going to go for broke and essentially try to cast um, some lethal burn spells, but it's not going to work out, I believe. If Nick, I saw, had at least a spell pierce. You saw a Force of Will earlier. I'm going to assume there's another blue card. So, so this yeah. start with Price of Progress. Right, so 
If there's a daze, I'll be dazed. It, yeah, otherwise, I'll be spell pierce, and then otherwise be force of will. <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, Nick is at six. So if this gets countered, it's basically over already. Yeah. So yeah, that, that that'll be enough. I mean, Drew is just going for lethal damage here, but there, there's no way to to pr to do it uh, once that price of progress is countered. Fire blast is only four damage, so th we're gonna pack up. Yeah, two. there we go. All right, Drew Levin didn't find his second land until about turn five or turn six there, and uh, Nick Miller found his uh, invigorate in, in just enough time, combined it with Vines of the Vastwood to uh, finish off Drew Levin. Yeah, and, and I mean, that came down really to Drew not drawing the second land yeah. for a long time. I mean, yeah. that's not a deck that needs a ton of land. I mean, you see how close that was for Drew without, you know, actually drawing a second land until the very end there. Right, Nick, Nick, Nick flooded. Well, I mean, literally. <laughs> <laughs> and the Goblin Guides made sure of that. But... That that was the thing. There is because because Drew wasn't able to deploy the spells in time. Well, it's really hard to catch up when your opponent has a proactive plan, and, and that's what you saw. So yeah, um, usually um, let's see. So usually the infect player, uh, one thing that they have against the burn deck in their favor is definitely that uh, you know again those pump spells. Well, they help you protect against lightning bolt. Ag and that's that's exceptional. So Drew is probably going to act at sorcery speed. Um, I'm just going to like try to surmise what they might have in their sure. We, we yeah we don't we don't actually have the deck lists yet. Uh, we'll we'll have access to those shortly. Uh, while you're doing that, let's just uh, give you an update. If you're not familiar with Drew Levin, if you haven't uh, if you've come to Magic recently, his name may be less familiar to you. He used to be a regular Magic columnist. Uh, you know, really like a grinder. Uh, you know, on the SCG circuit and at Grand Prix. Uh, moved into the the real world uh has uh, and is more of an occasional magic player these days uh nick miller on the other hand you know he's a he does video coverage for scg often found covering legacy events and modern events and the like and so uh you know a rare opportunity to get out uh in front of the cameras yes well you get out in front of the camera one way or another the camera always finds a way <laughs> So here we see these players just uh, pouring over their sideboard options. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm the thing. So from the infect side, you're usually going to have access to card. Fluster Storm's pretty decent. It acts as a spell pierce, and spell pierce is a card you do want against burn. Uh, you want to make sure you never get caught by a price to progress and or a fire blast so uh, something like Fluster Storm works really well, especially in spell sequences. Hydro Blast, I mean essentially apart from destroying the card mountain it does pretty much everything else <laughs> and most infect lists do run at least one hydro blast um sometimes two um and and that's really most of what you'll see uh the infect player will probably stick mostly to their plan because the cards that are good in the matchup um the pump spells you're you're going to keep every single one of them so you're not going to want to sideboard much because you still need access to the creatures since your burn opponent is going to aim to dismantle them um, specifically, um, as for what uh, Drew may bring in, uh, we're, I would surmise that we'll see Searing Blood. That, that would be the card that makes sense. Either Searing Blood or Searing Blaze. Um, essentially, uh, trying to, you know, not just deal with the creatures, but also deal uh, incidental damage uh, to Nick in the process. And that's really important. It's, the problem with aiming burn spells at creatures is that it removes your combo pieces. Burn is a combo deck. It's just that all the pieces go towards your right. opponent's head. But fundamentally, if you're going to destroy all your opponent's creatures, you need some other sources of damage. Now, usually that comes in the form of something like Goblin Guide or Eidolon of the Great Ravel or Monastery Swift Spear. And the Infect player can't really deal with these creatures very efficiently. So, that, so it's okay in this matchup to aim at the creatures because you do have that incidental damage source. But Searing Blaze slash Blood will really help here. Uh, do both, but I think both players are probably not going to change their decks much Because they're going to be more used to trying to have their sideboards tuned in for spell based decks um, Such as black red reanimator, which we might see a lot this weekend uh, Able to make a gristle brown on turn one means that a lot of decks are forced to play cards like Tormod's Crypt and surgical extraction And that means your sideboard slots are going to be a little more constrained So you may have you're gonna have less options to deal to, to win in creature mirrors as a result I saw one side, I've been keeping an eye on the bottom of Drew's deck as he shuffles to see if I can get a sense of what he's sideboarding. And the only card I've definitely seen is uh, Pyrostatic Pillar. 
Right, okay. So Pyrostatic Pillar is in the burn deck uh, for the same semi-same reason as Eidolon of the Great Revel. Is that, is that a main deck card, or is that a card he's bringing in out of the sideboard? Right, so main deck you have Eidolon of the Great Revel, and then you board in Pyrostatic Pillar. Uh, usually, again, against the spell-based deck. It's very good against Storm. For example, oh, yeah. if your if your goal is to play a spell and that every spell deals two damage down the line, well, right. Pyrostatic so Pillar does a good job here. Right. If you're not familiar with the card, it's one in red. It's an enchantment, and then whenever a player plays a spell with a converted mana cost of three or less, uh, the pillar deals two damage to that player. Right. It's it's basically I don't own the Great Revel is that enchantment in the form of yes. a, a creature as well. Um, now now against infects. Um, I can see wanting to bring in Pillar on the play, since your life total doesn't matter. So it's an asymmetrical effect. On the draw, I might be a tiny bit less convinced. So I think it's okay here. But on the draw, tapping out to play it on turn two is okay. But your opponent already has kind of set up, and they're just trying to push through lethal damage. So it can be a two or four damage burn spell, but you have to tap out, and you're not dealing with your opponent's board. So I like it a lot on the play. Uh, but on the draw, I'm uh, slightly less convinced. But here we'll we'll see Drew board it in simply because Drew's on the play. All right. Well, Drew likes his uh, opening seven. He's got two lands. He's got two one-drop creatures in Goblin Guide and uh, Monastery Swift Spear. Nick Miller, on the other hand, he's going back for six new cards. Right. And, and yeah, I, I really like uh, like the creatures are great in this matchup. It's really hard for Nick to interact with that Goblin guy, that Monastery Swift Spear, since all of Nick's creatures are one ones. <laughs> I mean, uh, especially on combat. The combat does not favor him. No. Like, like well, th there is one thing where Nick can pull ahead, which is a play that uh, some Infect players have to make from time to time, which is that Invigorate. You know, can be used on defense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and we, we you might you see might it see on it. the draw because you don't have a choice, right? You're like, well, this Goblin God is going to deal like infinite damage to me, so I'm forced to do it. But it's a really desperate play, especially when you uh, Mulligan. Um, right. Yeah, saw a noble hierarch there from Nick. I think I saw become immense invigorate. So all the pump spells seem to be there. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an infect N creature. Right. Uh. All right. He does his scry pushes to the bottom. And we are off, and Goblin Guide looking to undo that mulligan. <laughs> well, <laughs> these, yeah. these Goblin Guides have been leading Drew astray the whole match so far. About five cards uh, to the good Nick is so far, maybe six. <laughs> yeah, I, I, sh I need to face these Goblin Guides more often. They're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Since I never play the card, I, I'd like to face that one a little more often. Uh, the most but powerful yeah. Goblin Guide of, of all time, of course, was at uh, Pro Tour Austin, where on turn one, an opponent of the first round, opponent attacked with Goblin Guide, revealed Damnation, which was no longer legal in the format. Yeah, so somebody <laughs> believed that the format for that Pro Tour was extended, and it was standard I at the time. It was, so. it was a, a mod. That, that is like, yeah, the fastest. It, it's even incredible. You don't just win on turn one before your opponent does anything. You obliterate them from the <laughs> tournament <laughs> since that player had to drop. All right, yeah. so there's the Noble Hierarch. Double Goblin Guide for Drew. He also has the Monastery Swift Spear, which he can add to this board as well. Yeah. He also has, I think, a Rift Bolt in hand, which he could suspend. Yeah. Yeah, and, and basically this is the question, do you bolt the bird? <laughs> but here, uh, Drew prefers to pile on the damage. Um, I'm less certain about this, but like I think Drew might actually be light on burn spells. So one of the ways to maximize your value for them is to simply put as much damage as you can on the table and then not focus those burn spells on dealing with Nick's creatures, but on dealing with Nick. Yeah, and then Goblin Guide, first Goblin Guide misses, which guarantees that the second Goblin yes. Guide misses as well. Yeah. And uh, Nick's going to take five here. Yeah. I'm trying to wonder if these Goblin Guides are from Spain or France based off the fact that they came from the Pyrenees. It's really hard to tell. <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the series of Eurolands is one of my favorite uh, basic uh, land arts. Like, I, pr I personally use it a lot, so that's why. But, uh, yeah, here, though, Nick has is under a ton of pressure. The fact that is, this is already five damage on board, which means Nick will be at a virtual seven if he, uh, if he decided not to block, and that's two burn spells. And if Nick has a lot of... If I'm, if I was correct, and Nick had a lot of uh, pump spells in hand, right, that invig an invigorate of a come immense, then Nick is probably going to be forced to block, use one of those pump spells, and hope to draw another one. Um, but yeah, here, uh, here we see Nick yeah. goes down to eleven from his wooded foothills, gets a basic forest, obviously respecting uh, 
Price of Progress, a card we've talked about a bunch. Right. Um, and, and interestingly, if my opponent gets Basic Forest in this spot, I'm going to think that they don't have much counter magic in hand from Drew Spot. And the reason for that is, if they had a lot of counter magic in hand, they'd want to get a Tropical Island to kind of incentivize Drew to tap out for a two mana burn spell. So if I'm Drew, I understand that Nick is getting that basic forest because he doesn't have access to much counter magic. And, and I, I think that's kind of difficult to tell if you were in an actual game, but you have to think, why is my opponent getting a basic land in this spot when you're playing Legacy? When you're playing Wasteland, that totally makes sense. They're, that's a very easy solve. But in this spot, they're trying to play their own Price of Progress. But thinking further about it, you're like, Wait, but if they had days, they'd want me to play Price to Progress. All right, so Lightning Bolt, or Chain Lightning, I'm sorry, is going to go after the Blighted Agent. He played Blighted Agent, Blighted Agent and Glistener Elf last turn. Uh, Drew is going to kill the Blighted Agent. It's going to pump the Monastery Swift Spear from Prowess. Right, and Drew is deciding to target the Blighted Agent here. And I think that's actually an interesting um, choice. Nick has access to two Infect Creatures. Uh, however, if Drew manages to kill the Blighted Agent, something we might see Drew do, especially taking this line of killing a creature rather than trying to kill uh, Nick directly, uh, Drew might leave back a Goblin Guy. That's what I was wondering about as well. Because uh, the Glistener Elf is blockable. Yes, it's very <laughs> blockable. Oh, wow. Here we see an Invigorate. Nick Miller, you talked about this, the idea of a defensive Invigorate. Right. And normally, and this is kind of why I'm not a fan of like normally trying to do a burn spell at this spot, is because your opponent could use a pump spell and then it makes it harder to, to block, to, for them to, uh, I mean, they get an additional blocker here. Um, I mean, Drew has to expend another one at, uh, to respond here. But fundamentally though, uh, the creature could block, but would at least trade. So Dr Drew does have a lightning bolt. And he's able to attack for seven here. Double trigger on the Monastery Swift Spear. So there's a Force of Will on top. Yeah, yeah and, and the fact is here that, let's see, Nick has not been able to cast, um, deal any damage so far. This is just turn free. Um, so that, that attack would be for two. Um, if I was correct in Nick having become immense, I might have seen that wrong, but I believe I saw it. I think, yeah, I think I still see it in his hand, yes. Right, so there's Noble Hire can become immense. Uh, let's see, that would mean that Glistener atta Elf attacks for free infect, plus six is nine, we're one off. Yep. Right, so I think here Nick untaps draws an unfortunately extremely useless card in the right, spot. Right, we know that it's for so well. With no other blue cards in hand. Uh, and that actually is um, something interesting we might see this weekend. Uh, especially from the Def Shadow decks. Those sh decks uh, have a lot of black cards in the sideboard. So, like, having the right number of blue spells post-board is important because you need enough Force of Will activators, so to speak. Otherwise, you end up in this spot um, where you have Force of Will and it won't work. All right, there's a second Noble Hierarch. Right. Um, so, I, I would imagine that Nick is not at 11 here, um, by the way. Oh, no, no, he is not. He took seven last turn. Right, so, so Nick is go. at four. Right, perfect. There we go. So here, Nick is keeping the fetch line in hand to bluff that uh, he has access to a blue card for Force of Will. However, if I'm um, Drew, I will still go for it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, Drew just Drew. Searing Blaze. Searing Blaze. Not going to be super amazing with only... Although, yeah, that's, that's actually good enough to just finish him off if he can kill a Noble Hierarch here. Right, so... So then he would have three creatures, all two power or better. Right. Well, okay. So, so you know you win in that spot, and you're probably going to do something of that ilk. So you're trying to figure out as a result, well, okay, I know I'm going to win in this exact in that situation. So what am I trying to do that allows me to win in other style situations? And I think here, um, the right play, if you're, you, you don't want to necessarily uh, run out the Searing Blaze now, because, I mean, it only deals one damage, but because you don't have landfall, but that's okay. But you don't necessarily want to run it now because you don't want your opponent to have access to a bigger blocker. So while Drew attacks with all free, I think Drew should have tried to figure out... <laughs> 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 Sorry, that's great. Um, should I try to figure out here, uh, should I stay back and block the Glistener Elf? Because I think Drew is going to win anyways. 
uh, if he just attacks with two creatures, but he's unlikely to win by attacking with three. So I think here I would have actually liked an attack with two of the creatures rather than all three. Uh, since Nick is at least forced to block one. And if Nick uses a pump spell, then you can use the Searing Blaze. Um, you force your opponent in a really awkward spot, and you don't have to react uh, to what they're doing. You can, you, sorry, you can react to what they're doing and dictating the pace of play rather than being forced. And here you can see that double block. Um, I, at this point, I would 100% Searing Blaze the Glistener Elf because if Nick has a pump spell, at least it's out of the hand. Um, and you, you definitely get le you'll you'll get lethal at some point, so yeah. So Searing Blaze you and Glistener Elf for one. Yeah, so here Nick um, is probably going to be forced to become immense and draw Force of Will and lose the game. So <laughs> um, I'm going to say that this is a good spot to, to call it uh, to call it for a game free. Yeah, he's just going to cast Become Immense. There you see he's going to delve. Basically plus six, plus six for one mana. Is this, is this is it because we're gonna have uh, Reed Duke on camera that that we have the no concede mentality? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well there it is. You have perfect information. Yeah, you know saying, you're gonna. You know, a lot of times you're like, well, what what could the next card of my deck be? They see Nick getting. It. He's like, yeah, I know. He's like, I've 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 been there when people just concede. You know, inevitably, I, I like it when people play it out. So that's nice. I mean, it is, but you don't have to tell Drew that you have the card become immense in your deck. Yeah. While while it is common in Legacy Infect list to run one, and Drew might put you on the card, Drew has been, as you say, a little out of the game for a while, and you don't need to inform what the latest deck technology might be. You never know. Like, maybe Drew did not know that become immense was an option, and uh, that might change the way you play the game as a result. Or sometimes you maybe want your opponent to be thinking about it. When you have one, yeah, that's a that's a fair point. But but Drew is already thinking about all those pump spells, right? Invigorate for zero. <laughs> no matter what you do, your opponent might be, you know, tapped out. You know that, that Invigorate can come along. Um, but yeah, uh, here that, what, what made Drew win was that constant damage from creatures. Th they ended up being four six-point burn spells. And that's really, when you're on the play, that, that really goes far. Um, and that's why he uh, Drew decided to not destroy the light of the Noble Hierarch was because of that amount of pressure. Um, it was a close call. I think Drew took the right decision there, but it's a very close call. Yeah. And, if, and the decision in the end was, well, while the Noble Hierarch is a critical and important card, the fact is I still lose to Blighted Agent, Invigorate, uh, Become Immense. So I'd rather keep this burn spell for later for one of those cards rather than having to deal with Noble Hierarch now. Because Drew had really expensive and conditional burn spells. Like, Riffle takes a while. Um, and, uh, yeah, that Searing Blaze came off the top. And, the, the, uh, and you know, like, it's better to try to dictate the pace of play to not lose. Um, that, that's why I recommended to attack with two creatures rather than one was just um, to, to kind of play around that pump spell. But because you will win the next turn anyways, right? Like, attacking with all three creatures next turn will for sure win the, the game. So you might as well not attack and give make sure that your opponent has zero outs. Right. Um, Thinking about that monastery swift spear, you know, it's kind of it's always interesting to me to see where cards can find their way into legacy. If you've been doing cons of Tarkir flashback drafts on Magic Online, you've seen some monastery swift spear action this week. Wow, Just you're playing that in cons of Tarkir draft. Like that's so that's awful. You don't get to play, like, like Cards of Tarkir draft is about multicolor nonsense, and you play Monastery. It's all. It, it's not that it's a bad strategy. It's that you're deciding to not oh, play that, the best part of the format. Well, you know, if, if a lot of times you play that red-white deck, and you're just super aggressive and super low to the ground and just playing all the spells you can cry are, are, are we at least splashing Flying Crane Technique in this deck? <laughs> so, so, yeah, sorry. So for those that went from Legacy to Draft there at home, uh, yeah, Flying Crane Technique from that format was uh, as close to you win the game as possible. A really cool Jeskai spell. Um, but, yeah, um, as for sideboarding in this matchup, if you're wondering what... Drew, Drew would have just boarded out whatever the worst burn spell is. Um... Nick, on the other hand, will probably have, especially now on the play, shaved a number of Force of Wills because on the play you get access to mana. And I, I don't like being Force Flooded in matchups like these because they can be attrition-based sometimes. The first Force is very good. The second isn't. So usually shaving a Force is okay. It does, does have one in this opening hand here. I believe I actually saw two. 
I mean, that's one thing. If you draw too many Force of Wills, you can pitch one to the other. So it's not that bad. Um, See a couple of free spells. Fire Blast in hand for Drew Levin. Right, yeah. Legacy is about the stack. If you're used to, to Modern and Standard being about the board, well, limited to, obviously. Um, well, Legacy is about that stack. You have 1-1 one, one and 2-2 two, two creatures. Those are important, but it's they're only important because of the spells that follow them. All right, turn one Glistener Elf for Nick Miller here. Let's it, see yeah. how Drew Levin proceeds. Yeah. Uh, probably some turn one creature that attacks, I'm hoping, but... Um, it's important to note, actually, one of the things that makes Legacy fascinating is, again, in those formats like Modern and Standard, your spells are supporting your creatures. In Legacy, your creatures are supporting your spell base. It's actually like the reverse. Even in a creature combo deck like Infect, you're still just trying to find, you're still trying to play cards like Invigorate. Something to carry all that pump into the red zone. Exactly. Now, there's a Grim Lava Mancer. Oh, wow. That, that, now, that's some, that is some Molten Lava. Th yes. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A, a just continuing source of uh, damage from a creature that can just take out your infect creature every turn. Oh, yeah. I know that Nick not. Miller's like, this is not going to resolve. Pitch this is, a is not okay. This is not okay. Yeah. If, if you, if, right. If there was a card I would want to force to the match of Grim is Lava Mancer is that. It's just a recurring source of damage. And the fact that it can keep targeted creatures again and again means that it's really hard to grab a foothold in the matchup. So Nick is absolutely correct to force a will. And. Yeah. If you were to target a card, that this is why. All right. So Glisten Ralph gets in for one. And again, he only needs to do ten in this <laughs> because of in fact. So it's uh, it yeah, Glisten Ralph on its own mostly acts as a two one in that sense. Right. Although your opponent is never damaging themselves with fetch lands in 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 this instance. You know that pay one life requirement all of a sudden looks really free. I it mean, is very liberating sometimes to play against this deck in terms of, you know, just your lands coming into play untapped, you shot, you know, that, I guess that's more in modern, but. No, but, you know, you get to play Dismember and normally you're oh, yeah, half I mean, against a creature deck. You're like, oh, I have to cast Dismember. This is not. And uh, then you're against Infect. You're like, yes, this is great. So here now, now Drew is playing more of the burn deck that we see uh, as the archetype. And you see him cast Lava Spike, do three damage to Nick. Suspend a Rift Bolt. He's going to do three more damage when he gets to, if he gets to untap. Yeah, but uh, I, I had a glimpse of Drew's hand, and this is good at looking really bad. He kept that hand, I, I believe, mainly on the strength of Grim Lava Mancer. Probably drew two lands, so he's now got five in total between the board and hand, and Nick is very far ahead. Because Drew just doesn't have a recursive source of damage, Nick is very far... Um, yeah, three in fact now. Yeah. Gets in with the Ink Moth Nexus and the Glistener Elf. Yeah. I think even with that Ingmoff Nexus, you kind of need to target that Rift Bolt on Glistener Elf. Nick doesn't have that many cards, so this recurring damage will actually beat Drew down. So I think here it's correct to target the Glistener Elf, as Drew is doing. Yeah, totally because it, Yeah, because it reduces the clock, and it gives you a chance to draw a, a recursive source of damage you desperately need. Drew desperately needs that recursive damage, because no single burn spell is going to be enough against Nick. Nick is probably not going to walk into Price of Progress, um, which means that at, at most any burn spell is 4 damage, and with Nick at 15, that, that, that burn is not going to be enough. So Drew really needs Idol on the Great Reval, Pyrostatic Pillar. Um, even Goblin Guide would be, to would be pretty good here if Nick doesn't draw any uh, pump spells. Well, here's a Goblin Guide. You, you, you called for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you just need it. And, and now, Nick had the option to Force of Will that Rift Bolt if he wanted. Uh, and he also could have uh, Force of Will this Goblin Guide, but is choosing to, to keep that back. He's got a Brainstorm in hand. And, and, and it's interesting here for me because it's very close. Oh, if he has a Brainstorm in hand, then it's less close. You shouldn't force much. You should only force something that's really important. If, if the card was like another Force or Conditional Counterspell, then it's really close. I would probably not counter the Ripple since your opponent could draw a creature that invalidates Glistener Elf, or, uh, and, and there's better things to counter. And you still have Ink Moth Nexus as pressure, so there's not much incentive to counter Rift Bolt. Goblin Glide is recursive damage, though, so there was more incentive there. But if Nick has access to Brainstorm, yeah. um, I'm personally in favor of not forcing anything here, brainstorming away the four because you have a fetch land now, brainstorming away the force and whatever other card from these three that isn't that great, and then hopefully that's good enough to carry you. Um, if you draw a lot of lands, then I mean your hand is roughly right. the same, but whatever, you know, that's how Brainstorm works. If he draws two invigorates here, yeah. he could potentially win. Yeah. 
I mean, I mean, the cool play, the really cool and sweet play you can do here is play if if you have nothing else to do, play your fetch line, activate nexus, get that damage in, and then let your opponent attack goblin guy, draw a line, and then shuffle. <laughs> <laughs> you alluded to this earlier. Brainstorm is very good against the card goblin guide. It's one of the reasons you don't see goblin guide see more play in Legacy. It's very, 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 very bad against the card brainstorm. Unbelievably and, so. And do people play that card brainstorm in this format? Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, the, the, basically most of the dominant. Actually, it's impressive now. I think this is one of the legacy formats I've seen where brainstorm is not as omnipotent as it usually is. Death and taxes coming back in str in strong is really important because brainstorm is everywhere. It's so good. It's again if a great play, and we're gonna see this a lot more into uh, till end of day one, day two. The people that can cast Brainstorm well are going to blow your mind away as to how good the ceiling on that card is. It, it is unbelievable as a card. Actually, I think it was Drew Levin that wrote an article on how to play Brainstorm back in the day. I think it was AJ Soccer. Oh, was it Soccer? I'm so sorry, AJ Soccer. If you're I listening <laughs> in and I misattributed this, I'm well, so, so sorry. And this, this is what you just talked about. So uh, Nick put a fetch land on top of his deck. He now has a fetch land in play, can go sack, shuffle away what's ever there, has another fetch land, maybe has access to another Brainstorm here. Right. And even if you don't, the access to that extra fetch line means that um, when Drew decides to attack with Goblin Guide again next turn, you know, assuming there's a next turn, yeah. um, Nick can essentially look at the top card. If it's a land, draw it. But if it's not a land, Nick can essentially go, huh, I want or I don't want this card. And then based on what the card is, Nick can shuffle it away. So you can use Goblin Guide as a free scry in that way. Yeah. And Chain, Chain Lightning, by the way, kill, kills the Glistener Elf. Yeah. Uh, Nick Miller waits till his upkeep to sacrifice his wooded foothills. Uh, yeah, waiting until upkeep in Legacy is much more. So if you're coming from Modern, you're very used to seeing end of turn fetch land. But in Legacy, you see it much more often on the upkeep because you're trying to fight through cards uh, such as Stifle. So it's good habit, even though it may not have a strategic relevance in your specific match, to do it on upkeep for that reason. Also, unless you're playing maybe the Death Shadow deck, your, your lands tend to be dual lands that come into play untapped. So there's no cost to doing it during your upkeep. Exactly, right. Doing it end of turn or upkeep. Um, not, not a fundamental difference um, there. Except you have mana untapped in your upkeep, so it's better to do it there if you do decide. Um, but yeah, again, uh, killing the Glistener Elf, not too much of a concern for Nick. The main thing from Drew's perspective is it means that he doesn't have to consider Goblin Guide being held back, which is really important because you want your recursive source of damage to not be a blocker, but actual damage. Two, um, two cards left in hand here for Drew. Yeah. And here, Nick... With Drew at three poison counters, uh, attacking would put Drew to four, and then you would still need two attacks plus one p uh, pump spell. So the way the clock is going right now, Nick is the one slightly under pressure, but Nick also has access to a ton of cards in it. Well, he just needs five. one become immense, right? Like become immense is right. is just lethal here, assuming. Right, but there's only Drew usually King, one card of that card, a copy of that card. Um, interesting, you see, I saw that Nick had access to crop rotation in hand, so I think that uh, Nick is probably going to crop rotation for a Pendle Haven since that allows any burn uh, pump spell to get, uh, yeah. He doesn't get it right away, and the rationale for that is if next turn, Drew's at four in fact, so Pendle Haven would be that extra point needed with an Invigorate going from five to six and then to ten for, leaf, uh, for essentially lethal. Um, and, and here, Nick decides not to play the crop rotation um, because one of the plays Nick can make if uh, a Price of Progress comes through, for example, Price of Progress plus uh, Pyroblast, then Nick can uh, crop rotation, get a Wasteland, and make sure uh, that he doesn't just die to Price of Progress. So it leaves more options open. All right, so Eidolon of the Great Rebel, Fire Blast. These are the cards in hand here yeah, for Drew Levin. Yep. Yeah. This is probably going to prompt a response on crop rotation. The, the other reason to not crop rotation is it is a shuffle effect for Brainstorm. You do have a fetch land, but sometimes you want to use that fetch land on Goblin Guide, so Nick really maximizing the, his cards. But I think here we're going to see that crop rotation fired off. Um, you don't really want to take two damage incidentally at random, so... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Let's see, here with the Goblin Guide putting Nick to eight and that Fire Blast. The thing is, though, Nick will probably have a way to deal with that Fire Blast. Well, um, Nick, Nick has been holding that second copy of Force of Will for, since the beginning of the game. 
Right. Does, and does have other blue spells to pitch to it. Right, and while Force of Will is free, it is more than free in converted mana cost. So Nick isn't under danger from this Eidolon this turn. Next turn, though, it's probably going to be very close to locking Nick out of the game. So Nick needs to try to consider, how can I win the game next turn? How can I maximize my chances that next turn is the one where I'll win the game? And here Nick is also considering, I really want a pump spell. So can I wait on the crop rotation? Well, you could, but uh, as in, like, could I see the card with Goblin Guy, then crop rotation if I don't like it. Uh, but but he's, he's still holding a... F oh, he's going to sack the fetch land. Doesn't want to go to nine here. Um, I am not the greatest fan of this play. A and the reason f here is one life doesn't really uh, matter too much since Nick would go from eight to seven with one card in hand. Uh, so I'm not the biggest fan here because you really want... He could have saved a shuffle here. Right, save the shuffle for that Goblin Guide because imagine like the top... Uh, yeah, we get the Pendle Haven, right. But like imagine at the top of Nick's deck is like a counter spell. Then Nick doesn't want to draw that, um, but will be forced to because there's no shuffle effect. So here I think it's a slight misstep. You should have... I, I, I think here just sh like sacrificing... A tropical Island or a Forest would have done the trick. If you're worried about Price of Progress, you can sacrifice the Tropical. Okay, yeah, Nick has access to Forest Days and Flusterstorm. Um, here, do you want to... I don't... Let's see. If you get attacked down to 8 and there's an Eidolon in play, then you're kind of forced to win next turn. So Yeah, yeah you don't want this Blighted Agent. So, yeah, this is, this is what I was alluding to. You're going to draw a card you don't want. The, and then and now Drew is in a very good spot to to win the game, um, because the truth is Nick is going to can't take incidental damage from that Eidolon. Um, the attack from Eidolon and Goblin Guide will be four damage, putting Nick to four, um, which leaves room for one pump spell, which is which is all that Nick needs. So we're probably going to see three more turns. This one from Nick, where we're going to have an attack from Igmoth Nexus, powered up by Pendlehaven. Drew Levin's next turn where, he, where Drew is going to attack and then we're going to have Nick's last turn where he's going to have to probably top deck a burn spell. I think this is how this game is going to go down. Since Nick has both Force and Flusterstorm, so can stop probably two lethal burn spells as a result. All right. <coughs> so in comes the Nexus for two, in fact. It's going to take Drew to six. And here we're going to see Drew sacrifice two mountains to fire blast the Nexus. Okay. Uh, let's see. Drew is a little strange as Fire Blast would probably kill right. Nick straight up. Right. So Nick is going to respond with Force of Will. Counters that. I Wow. I Wow. The more I think about this, wow, I really am not a fan of that play. Um, if, if Nick... I mean, I, I understand why Drew did it now is because if Nick responded with Invigorate, then uh, the Penal Haven uh, would not work. But I don't, I'm not, I don't know here. Like, you would go to nine poison, but then you're not killing your opponent unless you top deck a burn spell. And you know your opponent All right, Nick is could at have seven. other counter magic. Yeah, it's, Drew yeah. has one card in hand. It's the one he just drew. Gets in for four. There's a daze. Yeah, another card you don't want. I, I, think if, I think here it came down to Nick not rationing those shuffle effects against Goblin Guide. Um... Drew at least one drew at least one bad card, and maybe the second one was unavoidable. But I think here Nick could have easily uh, pulled it through. I think right. it would have been he, hard he to get both shuffle effects in because uh, the crop rotation probably had to be before Eidolon, But at least one gave himself a chance, and I think here I don't I won't say like cost in the game right. since Drew, Nick could have drawn a, a terrible he card. Could have sacrificed land he tapped to go get the Pendle Haven, and yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I I think here like losing that shuffle effect may like basically close Nick out um, from getting additional chances to win the game. And you're going to see here, yeah. I mean, what an interesting little dance. <laughs> Ingwald Nexus blocks very well this pair of tutus. But yeah, here, um, the thing is, though, wow, just, wow. He just says go. Drew Drew, like, did Drew draw just lands? Because that would be the, the big reason for go. Since otherwise... Uh, if Drew drew a single spell, <laughs> any spell. Both players say go. Yeah. Three cards. There's a land for Drew off the top. What? What? What is happening? Because like, if Drew drew a single spell, he could have just attacked with both. Uh, Nick activates Ink Moth, blocks Eidolon. You fire off that burn spell. 
Nick can choose to respond or not. You don't. It doesn't matter because if the second Nick responds, Nick takes two damage. The goblin, the goblin guide would be lethal. So Drew probably just flooded out straight up. Wow. And that I mean, that is the most unlikely out for Nick. Is Drew draws awfully, and I mean, whoa, this is this game is continuing way past the point where this is. Wow, I, I did not expect the game to go to this extent. I mean, this can happen, but it's very uncommon. I mean, and, and that's... By the way, this is why a lot of top players like to play Brainstorm in Legacy. Brainstorm is flood insurance. The, the, if, the fact is, Drew is drawing a lot of lands because he doesn't have access to the card Brainstorm. With the card Brainstorm, being able to make sure that you can shuffle those excess lands away is so critical, and that's really what transforms a card into Ancestral Recall. So when you're choosing to play a deck without Brainstorm, you are accepting the fact that you might flood out as any other deck in Magic's history might. <laughs> by, by the way, we're also... This is... Time has been called in the round. You can see, you know, this matchup between two very fast decks has uh, actually consumed all the time. There's Ink Moth Nexus. There's Vines of the Vastwood. He's like, okay, you go to one. Right. Uh... Yeah, well. and it shows him two lands, and course, Nick yeah. Miller wins the match on yeah. just as time was called in the round. Yeah, and, and Nick totally got it. He understood if Drew had a spell, I would be dead. So Drew does not have a spell, so we'll <laughs> go for lethal damage here. Wow. Wow, that was crazy. So, in fact, uh, our first look at Legacy this weekend here at Grand Prix Richmond, and in fact, in the hands of Nick Miller, defeats burn in the hands of Drew Levin and we saw a, a really interesting dance on those last couple of turns that was, that was yeah that was very that was a tight rope but yeah I, I think in the end I thought Nick would lose because of that lack of shuffle effect but then Drew drew like pun unintended I guess and un, unavoidable too many lands yeah all right we got a couple brief messages and then we will be right back with more magic the gathering don't go anywhere 